Hello everyone, uh, this is Aarti Gupta and um, with profound sadness we'd like to note that Pramod Subramanian, a co-author of a paper in this session, is not with us anymore. Professor Pramod Subramanian was an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at IIT Kanpur in India. He received a bachelor's degree in electronics and communication engineering from the RV College of Engineering in Bangalore and a master's at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore as well. He worked for a few years and then started his PhD at Princeton University in 2012 with Professor Sharad Malik as his advisor. His PhD dissertation, Deriving Abstractions to Address Hardware Platform Security Challenges, won the B.D. Liu Award for the Best Doctoral Thesis at the Department of Electrical Engineering at Princeton and the 2018 ACM SIGDA Outstanding PhD Dissertation Award in Electronic Design Automation. After his PhD, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow with Professor Sanjit Seshya at UC Berkeley and in 2018 moved back to India to start as an assistant professor at IIT Kanpur. He won multiple Best Paper Awards for his research throughout, Best Student Paper at Host Symposium in 2015, Best Paper at the ACM CCS Conference in 2017, and the ACM Todai's Best Paper Award in 2019, which was just presented at DAC Conference earlier this week. Pramod was brilliant, intellectually curious, and generous in his collaborations. Always smiling, always kind, he was a caring mentor to all his students. His untimely death is a huge loss to us all. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm deeply sorry for the loss of the community. Um, and uh, thanks, Artie. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to the, to the section 5A of CAP20, the blockchain and security section. And uh, before we get started, um, uh, one logistic thing I want to mention is that um, for everyone who attend uh, this section, please um, go to the Slack channel in CAP20 and post your questions about the paper that, that you, 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 you want to ask. And then I will be uh, monitor those questions in real time and then uh, ask and then follow up with the author after the talk. And then our first speaker is going to be um, Emma Zong from Novi Financial, it's Facebook. And then she's going to present the Move Prover. And uh, welcome, Emma Zong. Hello, everyone. My name is Emma. Today I'm presenting some ongoing joint work with Kevin Chen, Shaz Kadir, Wolfgang Greenskem, Sam Blackshear, John Kill Park, Yanni Zohar. Clark Barry and David Deal on a formal verification system for smart contracts called the Moon Prover. I will start by introducing the background of the project, followed by an overview of the prover. Then I will introduce some features of our tool through a demo. As David has mentioned in his keynote, the Moon Prover verifies smart contracts running on the Libra blockchain. The global state of the blockchain is indexed by addresses, which you can think of as account IDs. Under each address, there are resources published either at the top level of the tree or as fields of other resources. All the smart contracts on Libra are written in the move language. Here is how one might implement a deposit function which deposits the check into the coin in move language. In the function, the check resource is destroyed and its value is unpacked and added to the coin reference. While this code might look simple, it is often hard to reason about the correctness of a complex program simply by inspection. And that's where our tool comes in. The input of Move Prover is Move source code, annotated with specifications which reason about the functional correctness of the code. First, the specifications are extracted from the input, and the Move source code is compiled into Move bytecode. Next, the specifications and the bytecode are combined to form the prover object model. The finalized model is translated into a program in Boogie, which is an intermediate verification language. The Boogie program is then translated into an SMT formula, which can be checked using an SMT solver such as C3 or CVC4. If the result of this check is unset, then the specification holds. 
Otherwise, a counter model is obtained from the sanity solver, and the prover interprets the boogie level counter model and presents to the user a source level diagnosis. Now let's take a look at how the prover works through some examples. Here we're looking at the pay from function in Libra account module, which withdraws amount of coin from the payer and deposits that coin into the payee's account. We can write specifications about this function in a spec fun block. For example, we can write that the balance of payer decreases by amount after the function call, and that the balance of the payee increases by the same amount after the function call. Besides pre and post conditions, we also introduce the abortive construct to, to specify the conditions under which the transaction should abort, such as when the payer or payee's account does not exist yet. All right, let's try running the prover on this module. Okay, we see that the prover returns with an error saying that the post condition that the balance of payer decreases by amount does not hold. And this condition is violated by the counter example when the payer and payee are of the same address when they're both 0xd. This happens when someone transfers money to uh, themselves. At this point, we can either change the specifications to account for this special case, or we can um, change the code to dis disallow someone from transferring to themselves. If we choose to disallow this behavior, we can do assert payer is different. It's different from payee. All right, this way the transaction will abort if this condition is not met. So we're going to change the specifications for that as well. We add this new abortive condition, abort if payer is equal to payee. All right. Running the prover again on this code. This time, no errors were found. All right. So this was uh, an example about a local property for uh, individual function. Now let's look at a more global property applicable to the entire module. Here we define the um, currency resource Libra coin with a with with a value field in it. In the financial system, we obviously don't want currency to be created out of thin air, so we can use a prover to prove the conservation of currency resource. We define a ghost variable, which is used only for specification purposes, representing the total amount of currency. We increase and decrease uh, the value of the ghost variable when the coin resources are created and destroyed. We then apply the property that the total amount of currency stays constant after each function, uh, to all the functions except for mint function. Mint is a legitimate function which can be called by privileged accounts like central banks to make new currencies. So we're going to make an exception for mint. This way we have specified that only the mint function can change the total amount of currency. All right, let's try running the prover on Libra module. Prover returns with an error because it discovered another function that can change the total amount of currency, that is the burn function. Similar to mint, burn function can also be called by accounts like central banks to destroy currencies. So we're going to change specifications and make an exception for burn function as well. All right running the prover again on this Libra module. This time the property passes. The move prover is open source. You can find us on GitHub and the Libra repository. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name Okay, so we don't have a question from the audience, but I have a good question. So how do you handle uh, loops in, 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 in the move prover? So um, 
So does the does the programmer need to like specify some like a traditional like a loop invariant like traditional verifier? Um. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. So yeah. we do support loop invariants. Um, users can, similar to how we specify like uh, pre and post conditions in a spec from block, users can insert those spec blocks in the code as well, um, in the form of looping loop invariants. I see, I see. So I was wondering in terms of the specification languages. So in addition to support, let's say some some account is like let's say the sum of the total balance of is um, equal to some constant. Whether you can support a combination of like higher order function in the sense that let's say I want to say the the sum of the of the account that is satisfies some certain condition is going to gray or equal to certain values. Do, do you allow? Is your current specification language allowed to do that? So you're talking about uh, let's see. So like I was thinking that proving that certain. Uh, like the balance of certain accounts are always greater than some value, like that. Under some condition. Under some condition. Yes. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't think we we can prove that yet because we're focusing like mostly on proving um, the modules that are currently in a standard library. Uh, I don't think we have any use case for that kind of properties. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Yep. Um, okay, so our, our next speaker is um, Daydream Park from Runtime Verification. And the type and the, the, the paper is about end-to-end -end verification of Ethereum 2.0 uh, deposit smart contract. Um, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Daejun Park. I'm going to talk about formal verification of Ethereum 2.0 deposit contract. First, let me briefly explain the Ethereum 2.0 deposit contract. Ethereum 2.0 is the next generation Ethereum blockchain system that is based on a new proof-of-stake consensus protocol. Unlike the existing proof-of-work protocol that is driven by miners, the new proof-of-stake protocol is driven by so-called validators. In Ethereum 2.0, anyone can become a validator. To be a validator, you need to deposit some amount of your Ether as a stake, and you can deposit your Ether by sending a transaction to a special smart contract called deposit contract. The deposit contract essentially maintains a special purpose ledger that records who deposited how much Ether. For example, the ledger records that Alice deposited 10 Ether, Bob deposited 20 Ether, and so on. Here the size of ledger is fixed to 2 to the 32, which can cover more than 4 billion validators. Because of its size, the full ledger cannot be stored on-chain, so the deposit contract stores only the root hash of the Merkle tree representation of the ledger. A Merkle tree is a perfect binary tree, and its leaf nodes store the hash of each entry of the ledger, and the non-leaf node stores the hash of its two children. This way, you can construct a Merkle tree from the ledger, and the deposit contract stores the root hash of the Merkle tree on chain. One thing here is that the set of validators is not fixed but keep changing. You can become a validator anytime, and you can leave whenever you want. That means the deposit contract needs to recompute the root hash of the Merkle tree whenever a new, new validator joins. To make the recomputation efficient, the deposit contract employs an incremental Merkle tree algorithm, which can recompute the root hash in logarithmic time in its tree size. This is much more efficient than the original algorithm that is only linear in the tree size which is, which is 2 to the 32 in this case. 
But this efficient algorithm is quite non-trivial and unintuitive. Indeed, several people even misunderstood the algorithm and claimed that it was wrong, which is not true. The deposit contract is critical for the security of the entire Ethereum 2.0 system, but its, it, but its correctness was unclear. So the Ethereum Foundation asked us to formally verify their deposit contract. In this paper, we present our formal verification of the deposit contract. To have an end-to-end -end guarantee with a reasonable amount of effort, we use the refinement-based approach as follows. We first wrote a formal model of the deposit contract in the K-Framer, which essentially formalized the incremental Merkle tree algorithm and it proved its correctness that it computes the same root hash with the original algorithm. Then using the same K-Framework, we formally verified that the compiled bytecode of the deposit contract is a refinement of the formal model. At this point, we don't need to reason about the algorithm correctness anymore but only ensure that bytecode faithfully captures the algorithm itself. Putting these two together, we conclude that the compiled bytecode computes the correct root hash of the Merkle tree representation of the deposit ledger. Here are some quick statistics about the verification effort. The entire verification took seven many weeks where the correctness proof of the formal model took two weeks and the refinement proof took five weeks. The size of source code is around 100 lines of code and the bytecode is of around 3000 instruction and the mechanized proof is around 1000 lines of code. Finally, let me show you some of our findings during the verification process. First, we found a critical bug in the algorithm implementation. Indeed, this bug had been survived even after several careful manual reviews, and we also couldn't detect this until we got, got stuck at proving its correctness. To be sure, here is a count example. If the deposit ledger is fully filled, that means all the leaf nodes of the Merkle tree are non-zero, then the bug implementation returns always the root hash of empty Merkle tree, regardless of the current leaf nodes, which is totally wrong. This bug has been fixed in the latest version. We also found several critical bugs in the compiled bytecode. Most of them were introduced by the compiler due to compiler bugs. Indeed, we took the compiled bytecode as a verification target instead of the source code because we don't want to trust the compiler and it turns out that our decision was very right. To sum up, we formally verified the Ethereum 2.0 deposit contract. We used the refinement-based approach to achieve the end-to-end -end guarantee with a reasonable amount of effort and we found several critical bugs in both the algorithm and compiled bytecode. Please check out our, our, our paper for more details and the GitHub repository for the verification artifact. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's thank the speaker. So, um, so we still don't have a um, question from the audience, so I'm not sure whether all the audience know like, how to pose a question on Slack. Uh, but I have one quick question. Um, uh, so, so you mentioned some like a critical bug that you found like uh, from Ethereum uh, 2.0, which is very impressive. Uh, but I was wondering, like, what's the price of like finding those bugs? Because um, there could be some false alarm due to the over approximation of your refinement, or there is a bit uh, like a false alarm, or in other sorts of verification. So, what's the current status in a, in the sense that in order to find those critical bugs? So what's the, like, a false positive rate looks like? So, good, thank you. Uh, good question. So this is not actually fully automatic verification. This is uh, 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 semi-automatic deductive verification. So mm -hmm. it requires extension human effort to 
write down invariants and uh, um, refining this spec as well. So the main cause is essentially the human effort. As I said, it took the seven weeks, seven nine weeks, uh, with, uh, which is not just just free. Yeah. I see, I see, I see. And do, um, is there any is any like among all the specifications that many written by the by the by the by the expert, by the domain expert? Do you think there's any is there any part of the like a like a proof that can be automated? Uh, for this 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 contract or in general? Mm -hmm. Like in the sense that is any part of the proof then that, that can be like a automate, automate. Oh, oh sure, right. sure. Yes, yes, sure. Actually what, what really happened is it's not uh, uh, kind of layered. So uh, we break down the main theorem into more, small, small pieces and then actually we we send them to the uh, Jet3 to solve. So uh, the, 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 the key thing is that how to actually break down the proofs into some smaller form that can be automat automatically verified um, by the SMT server. So yes, yes. Uh, but uh, I, it, it's kind of un un unavoidable to have a, a human guide to, to <laughs> man manage and organize the entire proof because the, the high-level specification is really high-level and then that needs to be somehow refined down to the low level. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Didi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Pablo Godiro uh, from University of Madrid. And uh, he's going to present the synthesis of super optimized smart contract using Maxa. Uh, welcome. Good morning, I'm Pablo Gordillo. I'm, I'm going to present the work synthesis of super optimized smart contracts using Max SMT. It's a joint work with Elvira Alberta and Alberto Rubio from Complutense University of Madrid and Maria Set from University College London. Let's start with a small introduction about superoptimization and Ethereum. Superoptimization is a technique that, given a source program as an ACOS function, it tries to find a target program that currently implements the source one with minimal cost and using a constant solve. And Ethereum is an open source public blockchain based distributed computing platform. It appeared six years ago and can be considered as a successor of Bitcoin. For instance, Bitcoin only stores information about the transactions. And Ethereum is not only stores information about these transactions, but also stores information about objects, data structures, and it's able to perform computations. Why? Because it includes a virtual machine, the Ethereum virtual machine, that executes a stack-based language, the ABM bytecode. It is too incomplete, and the programs that it executes are called smart contracts. And the most popular language to program them is Solid. It's also important to note that once a smart contract is deployed on the blockchain, its code can't be modified. So the EVM bytecode is immutable when it is stored on the blockchain. And finally, it's also really important the notion of gas. It is a measure of the computational resources that a transaction needs to be executed. So the user has to provide gas or has to pay for gas in order to execute a function. And this gas depends on the amount of memory and storage used by the function and on the concrete EVM instructions executed by the function. Here we present Syrup, that it's a, a tool that implements our method for super optimization of smart contracts. It takes a smart contract, compiles it into the EVM bytecode and split this bytecode into basic blocks that are a smaller sequence of EVM instructions that are super optimized in order to get a new sequence of instructions that generates the same stack than the original one but consuming less gas. For instance, imagine that we have the block that you can see on your left hand. This block generates this stack consuming 89 units of gas and zero automatically infers this other block that generates the same stack but it only consumes 15 units of gas. And in addition, this solution, this block is optimal in the sense that uh, it consumes the minimum amount of gas needed to generate this stack, which is the plan for the rest of the talk. I'm going to so you the main parts of our methods that and we see we see it as a synthesis problem with two main 
steps in the first one we generate a stack functional specification for all the blocks a description of the initial and the target stack and once we have this description we use it to generate a max, a max SMT encoding after that I'm going to show you our experimental evaluation and finally we will end with the conclusions of future work starting with the stack functional specification as I have just mentioned it is a functional description of the initial stack when entering the block and the final stack after uh, executing the block so it is a description of the stack before and after the execution of the block we generate it using symbolic execution for instance imagine that we have the same block that I showed you before the initial stack of the block contains one element uh, represented by this S0 variable and we can infer this information statically how? well we can use the control flow graph and the basic block to infer how many elements are uh, located on the stack at any point of the execution why? because we know how many elements uh, consumes or produce each of the EVM instructions and we also generate using symbolic execution the final stack, the target stack that is described in terms of initial one as you can see we have also this S0 variable and we also have sub-expressions that corresponds to some of the EVM instructions once we have this target stack we also apply some simplification rules based on semantics of the of the bytecode for instance we realize if all the arguments of the arithmetic operations are integers we generate simplification rules of the units element the unit elements of each operation the impotence and for instance in this case we are able to simplify this expression because all the arguments are integers and then we get this final step once we have the SFS the stack functional specification for all the blocks we can start with encoding of our max SMT prop we have to find the balance between a weight coverage of EVM optimization and an encoding in a simple theory for an SMT solver in order to make it scalable so in order to do that we focus on stack operations in those operations or in those all EVM operations that duplicates elements of the stack push constants on top of the stack, remove the top of the stack or swaps to elements of the stack and we are going to consider all the other EVM instructions as an interpreted function so the first step that we have to apply on the SFS that we have just generated is to abstract all the sub-expressions that appear there for instance in this case we have to, sub to abstract these two sub-expressions using a fresh variable y and in this case it is the same one because we realize that the argument of this uninterpreted function the argument of these sub-expressions are the same so they are going to produce the same result we also need to infer a bound on the number of the EVM instructions on the maximum number of EVM instructions that our solution are going to have and on the, size, on the size of the stack on the maximum number of elements that are going to be on the stack during the execution we can use different heuristics to infer these bounds but a sound approach is to consider the bounds of the original block for instance in the original block <coughs> the original block has in this case nine EVM, EVM instructions and the maximum number of elements that are on the stack during the execution is five once we have these these bounds we can start with the with encoding and the first step is to model the stack we have uh, we need variables to encode the content of the stack before executing each of the message. so we are going to use existentially quantified variables x i j to express the word at position i of the stack after executing the first j operations and we also need these propositional variables u to express the words that the stack currently holds why? because we are going to have as many uh, stack variables as uh, possible elements that as all possible elements that can be on the stack but no no but we are not going to use all these all these elements in each step so we need these variables to represent that the word at position i after 
of the stack after executing the first VA operations is active, that it has an element and we are using it after the first VA operations. The second step is uh, the encoding of the instructions and we can classify the instructions in three main groups. The stack operations that are those that I have just mentioned, the non-commutative and interpreted functions and the decommutative and interpreted functions. And we are going to use existentially quantified variables Tj to express the instructions executed at step J. So imagine that I want to encode the bytecode DAP key. What I have to what we have to encode is that we have to check that we have enough space on the stack because this uh, bytecode includes a new element on top of the stack. So this uh, constraint checks that we don't reach the, our bound on the number of stack elements. We have to, to ensure that uh, the element that I want to duplicate, that it's the element located at position k minus one of the stack is exist. We have in the next step, we are encoding the step j in the step j plus one, the top of the stack are going to have a, a new element that it is the one that we are duplicating and the element on top of the stack in the next step is going to be the element stored at position key minus one in this step. And finally we also use this constraint move rest to represent that all the other we have to move one position all the other elements that are on the stack. Why? Because we are including a new element on top of the stack and all the other has to be we have to move all the others one position. What happens with the other operations? It's it's similar. For instance, if we want to encode an, inter an, an interpreted function, we have to ensure that the arguments of the interpreted functions are on the stack and they are uh, stored in the positions where they have to be. And then we are going to use here, in this case, we are going to use the, the first variable that we use to abstract the, the interpreted function in the in the SFS. We also use NOP instructions to represent the NOP operations and in order to avoid the redundant results we include this constraint. So once we have chosen a NOP operations, all the remaining ones have to be also a NOP. And with all these elements, we can generate a constraint on the instructions with the NOP constraint. And for all the steps, all possible uh, instructions of our solution, we have to encode or to generate a constraint for all the, the ABM instructions that can be executed in our block. What else do we need to complete the encoding? We have to generate a constraint to describe the initial stack, which are the elements located in in the in the stack before executing the block a constraint to describe the target stack the stack that we want it we want it, uh, to it the constraints a constraint to initialize the, sta the stack variables a constraint on the instructions that it's the it is the one that i have just shown you and finally we also include an additional constraint in order to help the solver and improve the performance and it, and it is that all the interpreted functions has Event has to be used eventually. With all these, with all these constraints, we can use a, a SMT solver, and we are going to have all the models that satisfy these constraints. But remember that we want to get the optimal one. So to this end, we know that the cost of the solution can be expressed in terms of the cost of every single instruction because the gas that a basic block consumes is the addition of the gas that each uh, single EDM instruction consume, consumes. So we can code it as a max, SMT, so, uh, a max SMT problem. We can use the SMT formula that we have just generated as, has, as a hard constraint that are the constraints that has to be satisfied. And then we can count the cost of choosing every EVM instruction at, at each step as sub-constraints. That are those that are going to be minimized by the solver. And with this encoding, we can uh, obtain the, 
our optimal solution, our optimal block that consumes less gas than the unit. Regarding the experimental evaluation, we have tested test it with three different solvers, set, set three, Barcelogic and OptimaSat, and we use, uh, we analyze two different data sets. In the first one, we analyzed 150 most cold smart contracts on December 31 last year, and we analyzed more than 45,000 of labs, getting the results that you can see on the screen. For instance, the solver were able to prove that uh, around 65% uh, of the blobs analyzed were already optimal. We can't optimize them, but they also found an optimal solution for more than 13,000 of blobs, and they were able to prove that the solution that the, that they found were were optimal. There is also a small number of blobs where the solvers found a better solution, but could, they couldn't prove that the solutions were were optimal. And we also have uh, as a small number of, of blocks where the solvers couldn't find a solution, and we get the original block. Finally, we also set a timeout to 15 minutes, and we get uh, between a 3 and a 4 percent of of the blocks that reach this time. Despite this timeout, around 95% of the results were found after 10 seconds of execution. And the second data set, we compare our tool with EPSO, that it's a tool published last year that also tries to opt super optimize EVM bytecode, and we analyze the 61,270 blocks used in EPSO, improving its results a lot, as you can see on the on the table. Why? Because if you take a look, we reduce a lot the number of timeouts that EPSO gets. And we were able to analyze a higher number of, of blocks. Why? Because EPSO uses bit vectors theory and the in Ethereum the bit the words are of 32 bytes. So this bit vector has 256 bits and it adds a huge overhead on the performance. Just to conclude, I showed you the main parts of our method for gas super optimization of smart contracts. We focus on stack operations in order to make our approach scalable, and we consider all the other EVM uh, instructions as now as an interpreted functions. We can apply our we can split our method in two main steps. In the first one, we apply symbolic execution to get a stack functional specification of each block, a description of the initial and the target stack, and we use this description to get an effective max SMT encoding. We have analyzed more than 45,000 of blocks, and we were able to optimize around 30% of the blocks. Assuming that these savings were uniformly distributed, we would save $1 million from 2017 to 2019. And finally, as future work, we plan to increase the operations involved in the optimizations. We plan to study more details optimizations that involve the memory and the storage of code because those uh, these last ones are more expensive and for the moment we only handle a small optimizations that involve them. We also plan to study interblock optimizations to consider several blocks as a single one and try if we can optimize them. And finally we also plan to include information about the original block in the encoding. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Pablo. So our first question is from Shwendo. So his question is that for the block that you um, optimize, do you observe does the block contain any conditional or like a method call that involve dynamic dispatching? And also the second question from Shwendo is that do you observe, like for those EVN instructions, do you observe any instruction whose gas usage is actually like depending on some, like, like some other, other, other variable? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, well, uh, related to the first question, uh, no, uh, the blocks uh, don't contain any conditional conditional instruction. For instance, well, the only conditional instructions that we it can, that the blocks can can have is is a, a conditional jump, and we and the the basic blocks don't contain any conditional um, any conditional jump and it contains uh, it may contains method calls in the sense of calls external calls to other contracts 
because we handle them as interpreted functions. And uh, I think that it's the first question because we split the if, when we get the the control flow graph of the of the contract of the Indian bicycle, we split <coughs> basic blocks that are the the main blocks that. Uh, reads a, a jump instruction, for instance, we split them in a smaller blocks uh, using the, the EVM instructions that don't have any effect on the stack. Mm -hmm. so for instance, we don't have these, these kind of conditional instructions. And uh, regarding the data dependent gas use, uh, we, we, we are able to, to handle them because we consider all these data dependent instructions, for instance, uh, an exponential uh, bytecode as non-interpreted functions. So as as we consider them as non as interpreted functions, they are going to be in our optimal block. They are going to be in our solution. So we don't care about the, the gas that they that these these instructions consume. I see, I see. Um Okay, um, our second question comes from Alan Hu. I, th I think Alan actually has, a, uh, my, my, actually I have a similar questions in the sense that, so for, for, some fun for some instruction, they are very difficult to model. So you use, uh, you essentially use uh, an interpreter function. And then, which means that you essentially over approximate the actual semantics of the Ethereum uh, instructions. In that case, do you observe any scenario that you miss some opti uh, optimization opportunity due, due to the op uh, due to this over approximation? We well related to the, it's true that we only as we focus on this stack stack bytecode stack operations, we only we only encode the the semantics of the loop push uh, pop and swap, and for the other we we use this the. The semant these uh, simplification rules that I mentioned on the on the talk that are related to the semantics of the of the bytecode. So, for instance, we we use in the 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 unit elements of so of the arithmetic operations, the neutral element of the and or or so on, and we also encode some semantics related, for instance, in the in the in for S store or M or M load. But we don't encode uh, all these semantics, so maybe we can we can lose some optimization. But we don't have seen that we lose. Yes, we have seen that we lose maybe some of, of these optimizations, but most of them are related to the storage or the memory. And if we want to consider, then we should consider several basic blocks together, not the same one. If you implement it as a via subtraction, or so you won't be able to discover that. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Pablo, for for the answer. Thank you. So much. Mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so our next speaker is going to be uh, Andrew uh, Gasic from Amazon AWS, and he's going to presenting uh, stratify abstraction of access control policies. Hi, I'm Andrew Gasic. In AWS, developers share access to resources using the AWS policy language. On the left, we have an example of the textual language developers use. On the right is a graphic representation with the actual allowed access shown in green. The AWS policy language has allows and denies, conjunctions, disjunctions, negations, and conditions. It's a logic that's guarding access to some of the most important resources a company may have. It's crucial to get this right. At FMCAD 2018, we presented a tool called Zelkova for semantically analyzing AWS access policies using SMT. Zelkova follows a traditional verification approach. One human, usually a developer, writes a policy. Another human, often a security engineer, writes a specification of what's acceptable. And the machine does the verification to return a yes or no answer. This approach works, but it's hard to scale so that everybody can use it. The bottleneck is in the human effort it takes to specify acceptable behavior. Notice the asymmetry here. The specifier has to put in a lot of work up front to define acceptable behavior, and only at the end of the process do they get anything back, a Boolean, a single bit of information for all the work they've put in. So we thought, what if we could invert this? What if we could do this? We make the machine responsible for specification. We have the machine put in the upfront cost, and we have the machine return a detailed set of findings. Then, only at the end, the security engineer is the one who takes these findings and decides yes or no. 
Yes and no means something slightly different here too. The findings are produced by the machine and already verified to be true, but the human is deciding if the findings should be true. The human is expressing intent, which is exactly what we want the human expertise to be focused on. We want our security engineers to be making security judgments. To make this approach work, we need to design good findings. First, we need to be able to trust the findings. It's not enough to identify some of the accesses, we want them all. We need the findings to be sound. Second, we need findings to be precise. We could get soundness with a single finding that everybody has access, but that's not useful. Instead, we want findings to adhere closely to the actual access that's allowed by the policy. Finally, we need findings to be compact. We could get soundness and precision by returning a finding for each of the billions of allowed accesses, but no human could ever review them. Instead, we want the set of findings to be reasonably small. This is where stratified predicate abstraction comes in. Ideally, findings should use the terms that are relevant to the way access is controlled. Looking at this policy, for example, we can see that one of the ways access is controlled is via the source VPC condition. Let's extract a set of predicates for this variable. We have PTOP, which says that source VPC doesn't matter, and we have PA and PB that restrict to VPCs A and B. Similarly, access is controlled through the principal org ID condition. We can extract predicates for that variable too. These predicates are the policy-specific building blocks of our findings. We put them together in the simplest way possible, conjunction. With this set of predicates, there are nine sensible cubes of conjunctions we can form. Here they are laid out in a 3x3 three three grid. In the top left, we have the most general finding that everybody has access. As we move to the right, we get more specific findings, like Organization 1 has access. And as we move down, we get more specific findings like Organization 1 coming from VPCB has access. These cubes are all the possible findings we can return. What's left is to select a sound, precise, and compact subset of them. For example, we don't need the finding PTOP and QTOP. We can replace it with these four more precise findings. Every access allowed by the policy and by the finding PTOP and QTOP is allowed by one of these more precise findings. On the other hand, we can't get rid of PA and QTOP. This finding can't be replaced by these more precise findings. A request from VPCA and Organization 3, for example, is not covered by either of the two highlighted findings. Thus, the finding PA and QTOP is essential. It will be one of the final findings we return. Moreover, the two more specific findings will not be returned. Those findings are already covered by PA and QTOP. Similar reasoning shows that PTOP and Q2 is essential, and that neither of these two findings are essential, but this more specific finding is. In the end, our algorithm returns these three findings. Here they are written out in full. We formalize our algorithm in the paper, and we show it achieves our desired properties for findings. I'll give you a hint of the key notions here. We formalize soundness in a property called coverage, which says that the set of accesses allowed by the policy is a subset of the accesses allowed by the findings. We formalize precision in a property called irreducibility, which says that every finding represents some access which is not covered by more specific findings. Finally, we formalize compactness in a property called minimality, which says that removing any finding from the results shrinks the set of accesses allowed by the findings. Let's see how closely we achieve our informal properties of sound, precise, and compact on our example policy. Here are the findings shown as bold white circles. We can see the findings are sound and compact, but they're not completely precise. There are accesses here that are not allowed by the policy, but which are covered by the findings. To fix this, to improve precision, we would need to introduce negation. In practice, we found negation to be a source of frequent confusion and subtlety. For that reason, we're willing to sacrifice precision for the sake of simplicity. Another great thing about findings is that they're modular. Each finding can be understood on its own without the other findings. Contrast this with the policy where allow and deny statements interact with each other. For example, an engineer may look at these findings and decide, yes, this is acceptable. No, this one's not. And even, I don't know. I need to go talk to the developers and figure out if this access is really necessary. The security engineer can do part of the verification and put the other part on hold. Here's the landing page for a service that's available for free to all AWS customers based on this stratified abstraction technique. Take a look at this workflow for users. They start the service, review their findings, and take action. 
What's really going on here is that users are telling us their specification interactively. They're doing formal verification without even knowing that it's formal verification. And we have great engagement with this approach. Here's the findings overview page. I've attached our example policy to one of my S3 buckets, and we can see the three resulting findings here. These are just our cubes of predicates in a pretty printed form. Users can click on a finding to see more information. Here on the details page for a finding, users can see what resource is shared, how long it's been shared, and what permissions are granted, such as read or write. If the user decides this is intentional, they can archive this finding so it doesn't show up in the list of active findings. Or, if the user decides it's not intentional, we guide them to the appropriate console to go and fix this finding. Afterwards, they get updated findings which show if they've correctly resolved the problem. This is how we've used Stratified Predicate Abstraction to build an automated reasoning service that's available for free to millions of customers. If you want to know more, please visit our Provable Security website. In this work, we present a novel technique for the verification of quantitative hyperproperties. So what are hyperproperties? Okay, so we, we are still waiting for the question from the audience. So one one quick question. So in the in in your in your encoding, so essentially you use um you essentially use uh, this kind of a minimality to encode the, your like a part of your objective function in the sense that you want to minimize the number of variables that you want to appear to to the to the security auditors, right? So, so from your like experience, does the minimality always lead to like uh, the most like a comfortable and acceptable like output to the security auditors? Uh, so in practice, what we found is that people are pretty happy with the number of findings that they're getting. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead, where where they want more is adding more information on top of the findings. So, for example, yes, this account has access, but who is that account? Is it part of my organization? And then, you know, what level of access have, have they had? Is it read or read write permission modification? So a lot of times it's the kind of surrounding information uh, related to a finding rather than the particular details that they're interested in. I see, I see. So uh, the second question is from, from Ken. So Ken is asking, uh, can I think of the finding as a prime implication of the policy? Uh, yeah, it's similar. So, so not all variables are um, capable of restricting access. So, for example, if I say the username has to be Bob, that's not really restricting access because anyone can create an account and create a username Bob in it. So we don't consider all variables as important. And even the way in which you restrict access, uh, not all ways are equally valid. So if I say any uh, account whose first number is one has access, that's kind of nonsense. Like, what does it mean for an account to have first number one? Like it makes sense semantically, but not truly in terms of access control. So we purposely uh, don't generate predicates for that. So you can kind of think of it as like converting to DNF, but only through um, certain allowed, like good patterns of access control. I see. So so essentially that's actually relevant to Otis' uh, second question in the sense that like uh, for your finding, do you essentially find the minimum DNF representation for the best approximations of F by a monotone function? Is that is the answer yes? Uh, I think so, but but assuming some abstractions over the, the types of ways that people um, restrict access. So we purposely don't generate specifications that are misleading. For instance, you know, only people whose name is Bob or whose account number starts with one. We don't let you, you can't even like get a handle on those kind of bad nonsense notions. Okay, okay. Um, okay, thank you, um, Andrew. Thank you. from Andreas Linders from KTH Royal Institute of Technologies. And he's going to be presenting validation of abstract side-channel models for computer architecture. Hello and welcome to my talk on the validation of abstract side-channel models for computer architectures. Let's start by looking at the validation of processor models. With the sound processor model, we may execute a program with its inputs in the abstract model, and we would know that the real processor executes in exactly the same predicted way. When this implication is broken, we are in trouble, because all reasoning we did using the abstract model becomes unusable and void. 
This may be the case when either the intended behavior is not represented by a process or design, or if the chip is not faithfully manufactured according to the design. Such flaws may be intentional or honest mistakes, but it's a problem either way. In the literature, this problem is typically considered for functional correctness of the instruction set architecture using available hardware designs. Examples of these are the works of Fox, Bayer and others that deal with the architectures of ARM6 and VAMP. Our work deals with the models of four side channels instead and we perform validation by testing. We consider a scenario where two applications are running concurrently on the computer. For one, this is the web browser to log into a webmail account. And second, we concurrently execute a third party application like a free game or some other untrusted application. Clearly, the browser is dealing with confidential secrets on both inputs and output sides, while the third party application deals with public data only. And we now look into detail how the processor runs them. There is the architecture as a common interface for a family of processors and under its umbrella we find many microarchitectural performance features like hyperthreading, speculative execution and caches for the main memory. When the web browser executes and processes private data, some or all of this private data is scattered around in the state of the implementation. For our work we focus solely on the side channel cache. A subsequent execution of our untrusted third-party application is now able to extract parts of the secret from the cache state. This effectively allows this application to distinguish what secret values the victim application has processed before. Using, this, using existing attack mechanisms, this enables the reconstruction of whole secret values, and we clearly don't want that for our applications dealing with confidential data. So we want to verify security properties of software, like the absence of side channel leakage, like in the web browser example right before. This can be done by following the constant time programming policy and then verify the resulting program like it has been done by Almeida and others before. Because of the complexity of modern microarchitecture implementations, such verification methods do not directly deal with side channels. Instead, these methods commonly work with abstract attacker observations, which is the case in both literature and practice. The observations are phrased at the architecture interface and characterize what an attacker can potentially see. They shall never under-approximate the modeled attacker capabilities to preserve soundness. To make the presentation more concrete, we will use this example program and pretend that it is a snippet of our web browser program binary. It first compares two registers and branches based on their equality. One branch executes three loads from memory and then terminates. The other branch executes three loads with slightly different addresses and 14 instructions in between the first two loads. And then it terminates as well. These 14 instructions are no memory operations. To approximate an attacker that has access to the cache, we choose the address of all memory accesses as abstract observation. In our concrete program, this corresponds to observations at each load instruction address. One can now use the observation model by pairing states where the abstract attacker does not learn anything from looking at the side channel. This means that states which produce the same sequence of observations are to be considered indistinguishable for a real attacker. Here is an interesting example of two such states. In S1, X0 and X1 are not equal and thus the sequence of observations is 1 megabyte, 2 megabyte and 3 megabyte. S2 takes the other branch and if one follows closely, the observations are exactly the same when we consider that the 13 other instructions are not affecting X4 and X3. The burning question is now, are the models actually sound? And as it turns out, not too far in the past, the Spectre family of attacks has been presented by Kocher and others, and they have disrupted the soundness of all existing observation models. In fact, the model that we use in this example is not sound for processors with speculative execution. The execution of a victim may be carried out under speculation by the processor, which can lead to cache effects that are not explainable just by the architecture interface. Unsound observation models ultimately lead to broken crypto implementations that can lead to leakage of cryptographic keys. This is obviously a very bad situation.
So let's revisit the implication from the second slide. We want to validate the soundness of the abstract observation model. That means equivalence of the abstract observations for two states implies that the attacker is not able to distinguish the executions of these two states. Say we execute the program P on states S1 and S2 like before, and in both cases we obtain the same model observations like in our example before, 1 megabyte, 2 megabyte and 3 megabyte. Then we expect that the analysis of the actual side channel does not show any difference when executing P on S1 and S2 on a real processor. In our work we validate side channel models via testing. But the mesh and state space is huge. On top of this we need to come up with test cases consisting of a program and two input states. This makes the task of finding interesting test cases here much harder than finding them for functional correctness. With our framework ScamV, we want to semi-automate and support the task of finding counterexamples to this implication. The framework is driven by an observation model, the functional architecture model and a little guidance by the user. This is the high-level architecture of ScamV. The observation models we explored before and the code to probe the side channel are the inputs on the left. Inside, ScamV runs as a loop that generates test cases and checks their side channel effects on an actual machine. A test case is a pair of initial machine states and a program with which the states produce the same sequence of abstract attacker observations. After executing test cases on real hardware and probing the side channel like an attacker, we keep all test cases that help the attacker and thereby present counterexamples to soundness. Now we look into the experiment generation in more detail. First, we need to generate a test program. For this, ScamV supports the specification of program templates that are randomly instantiated. One of the templates we implemented produces the example program we looked at before. In the second step, we use the observation model to augment the program P with the attacker observations. Also here we may use the observation model from before, where all memory operations produce observations using their accessed addresses. Afterwards, we apply symbolic execution under the corresponding ISA semantics to the program with observations. This yields the set of all execution paths with their associated symbolic observation lists. Notice that this step limits the scope of ScamV to terminating programs. But let's see the relevant steps of our example program from before. For the example program, the symbolic execution is relatively simple. In the beginning, the path condition is just true as usual. In the second program line, we branch depending on whether x0 and x1 are equal or not. If they are not equal, the next three loads execute and the program terminates. Here, the observations can be copied from the assembly code because there are no additional register manipulating instructions. We obtain the corresponding list of symbolic observations as symbolic expressions evaluated in the initial state. If the two registers x0 and x1 are indeed equal, there are slight differences in the observation list. The first observation is the same, x2. Then we have one update to x3 and as mentioned earlier, 13 instructions that do not affect x4 or x3. And they also do not access the memory. The second observation is simply x4 because it has not been updated. The th third observation has to take into account the update to x3. This means that the abstract attacker observes x3 plus 8. With this, ScamV has obtained a path condition and a symbolic observation list for each execution path of the previously generated program P. Now it uses these to generate a formula that expresses whether the execution of two states produces equal observations or not. We start with the output from the symbolic execution on the left. The relation is about the two states S1 and S2. In order to characterize equal observations in general, we consider all combinations of execution path for each of the two states. We illustrate the process for the combination where S1 executes the left path and S2 executes the right path. The formula we want to fill in there has to say, if the states S1 and S2 are indeed executing the left and the right path respectively, then the observation lists produced from these initial states agree. In this case we concretely have, 
if S1 satisfies the path condition of the left path and S2 satisfies the path condition of the right path, then the first observation of the left path, that is X2 evaluated in S1, has to match the first observation of the right path, X2 evaluated in S2. And so on for observations 2 and 3. When we are done, we fill in the whole table and create the relation as a conjunction of formulas that we find in the table. It can be simplified a little bit by eliminating symmetric cases, like in this case here we can remove the top right field of the table. After generating the relation formula accordingly, ScanV feeds it to an SMT solver to obtain a satisfying assignment. Since we know that the concrete instances of S1 and S2 produce the same attacker observation values when executing the program P, we are now ready to bundle the three together as a test case for the real hardware. The test on the real machine then reveals whether the generated test case is indeed indistinguishable for the attacker or instead a counterexample to be collected. These counterexamples are then presented to the user of ScamV that can then understand what has been missed in the observation model before. A refinement of the model could then be the input to a new validation process of ScamV to attempt to find a sound attacker abstraction. Alternatively, the processor implementation or configuration can be adjusted and tried to see whether an intended attacker abstraction suits. To evaluate ScamV, we build a hardware infrastructure with Raspberry Pi 3 boards. Actually, it's running and humming right now under my desk. No. Anyways, the boards feature ARMv8 processors, which are simple, and they do not execute speculatively according to their documentation. For the ISA semantics, our implementation relies on the model by Anthony Fox, which is embedded in Hall 4. When it comes to the attacker model, we do not consider timing channels, but rather access-driven attackers that are probing the cache state with attacks like prime and probe or flush and reload. These measure cache occupation indirectly with the help of line evictions and for this reason carrying out such attacks can be tedious and time consuming. Therefore our implementation relies on special debug instructions in the processor to probe the cache. Our process to emulate the worst case attacker first clears the cache, then executes P and then expects the cache using ARM trust zone instructions. By this approach we are able to compare cache states at arbitrary granularity level. A real attacker would get to the same conclusions after devoting enough time or creativity. The observation model is based on the addresses of read and write operations as before and these should be the only ones that affect the cache state. All other instructions should be immaterial for the cache. And so we expect it to not find counterexamples with this setup. And to our surprise, we found something we call prediction. Normally, a processor evicts lines if a cache set is filled and it wants to fetch new data to the same cache set. Under certain conditions, our processor evicts lines before the set is filled. Remember that the practical attacker measures the eviction of lines and so if the prediction condition is dependent on key bits, an attacker clearly learns something from probing the cache. Now our example program and the machine states from the introduction shine. On one hand, if we take S2, which executes the second part of the code, then the cache state after the execution just contains the memory blocks at 1 MB, 2 MB and 3 MB, as we would expect from the order of loads. S1, on the other hand, executes the first part of the code and from the resulting cache state we can imagine that the blocks at 1 MB and 2 MB have been loaded to the cache at first and then the processor predicted 1 MB and filled the line with the block at 3 MB. This test case shows that the observation model is unsound because it produces equal observations but the attacker sees a difference. One way to fix this example would be the inclusion of, prog of the program counter as an attacker observation but in general this is not enough to account for prediction. For our second evaluation result, we used a slightly refined attacker model for setting with cache partitioning. We assume that the attacker is restricted to the cache set 127, like the red line in the figure illustrates. Thus, the victim would be able to use sets 0 through 126 freely. This is the adjusted observation model, where an observation is only produced if a memory access uses the attacker accessible part of the cache. 
With this setups can be successfully found the effects of the automatic prefetcher of the processor. In fact, the victim may trigger the prefetcher, which may cause cache effects in the attacker partition. This is an expected result because automatic prefetching is a documented feature of the processor we used. We can now conclude that cache partitioning is not secure in general, especially not if it is na naively applied. To make things even worse, the commonly used observation models that do not observe line offsets are invalidated by prediction. We believe that this is due to a subtle interplay of prediction and cache banking. This is quite bad because it opens up for vulnerabilities like the work of Troma and others has shown for cryptographic implementations that consider cache line offset of an address attacker invisible. Regarding the automatic prefetching, our experiments indicated that the prefetcher does not always fetch all lines according to documentation. It seems to stop at the 4K boundary, which could be used for secure cache partitioning if this actually is the case. Finally, we found a bug in the RMV8 model we used. There are two instructions for branching if a register is zero or not. Both behave the same in the model, while one of the two should work on a negated condition. For this work, we ran about 200,000 test cases on our boards. Quite many of these test cases, 107%, show interesting results, and we estimate our sequential running time to be between 10 and 20 days. The guidance we provided to ScamV test case generation is moderate. We implemented six program generators, of which the most striking counterexample consists of just five load instructions. This counterexample represents the offset dependent prediction from before. Finally, our experiments with the partitioned cache required a little bit of help. We implemented the enumeration of cache set indices in order to divide the search space. This accounts for a big fraction of the 1.7% above and therefore is probably a useful tool to guide the search for test cases more generally. To sum up, our work deals with the hypothesis that states with equivalent observations in the model are indistinguishable to an attacker on real hardware. ScamV validates this hypothesis and we evaluated ScamV with a simple processor and simple observation models. Relatively few experiments already yield unexpected and interesting counterexamples and we have produced an artifact for ScamV. I encourage you to check it out on GitHub and thank you very much for your attention. Hello. All right, uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, while we are still wait, waiting for the answer from the audience, uh, I want to make a quick uh, announcement. So basically because of the, uh, we ran into some technical issue in the previous talk, so we will be replaying uh, the same talk uh, on my laptop uh, during the breakout section on the same Zoom address, which means that if you want to uh, follow, uh, like a, all, um, attend the talk of the previous paper, please uh, don't leave and just stay in the current sections. And then both of the author as well as student volunteer and myself will be staying here, uh, uh, online. And so uh, we are waiting for the question from the audience. So one of the quick questions um, from me is that, um, so you said that during the verification process, you observe like a, it's, it, you observe like some, like a counter example that require like some input from the, from the auditors, right? So uh, based on your experience, what's the main cause of those counter example? Uh, sorry, we couldn't hear you clearly. You cannot hear me. Uh, can you maybe increase your volume a little bit? No. Oh, yeah, now it's better. Yeah. So um, which counter example do you refer to? I'm, I'm not sure. But in, your, I'm... in your in your architect, in your overview of the of your of your approach, essentially, you have the verification loop and then you generate some counter example, which essentially go back to the to the to the user, right? Yes. Yeah. And then the user is essentially supposed to provide some feedback to to refine some previous assumptions. So I was wondering during this process. So in your like a domain. So what's the main resource of like a imprecision that actually lead to those counter example that require the users additional input? So the counter example is caused by the by the wrong input kind of by the by the non matching observation model and side channel. So this mm -hmm. if, if observation model does not correctly abstract uh, an, an attacker, then mm -hmm. a real side channel, 
then um, then that would produce the counterexamples, and then a new validation round could uh, be done with a different um, observation model, for example, or also with an adjusted hardware, depending on what, which one is fixed. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and what we do right now is that we essentially collect all counterexamples to a pair. So if we have a concrete side channel and an abstract side channel, and we have a runoff of ScanV, then we collect all counterexamples we find to this instance of the implication, so to say. I see, I see, I see. So um, our second question is from Saeed. Um, so Saeed is asking, um, so your model is actually very close to the vulnerability. Uh, your model is actually very close to, to, the, to the model of the spectrum vulnerability. So he was asking whether your approach can handle the spectrum vulnerability. So we are working currently on extending ScanV to also um, produce, produce counterexamples for a modeling of, of uh, or, or for, a side channel that uh, would, uh, would, I mean, at the moment we are dealing with boards that don't have um, speculation and we don't have uh, um, enough guidance in our, in our tool chain to, to produce counter examples for spectra, but we are working on this right now. So, so indeed the model, it would be unsound for spectra as I also said in the, in the talk. Yes. I see, I see, I see. And uh, so, so, do you have any thought about like how to uh, like uh, like extend your current like model into like go beyond the, the scenario of cache side channel in the sense that let's say some other side channel like like timing or, or response side channel on on on, on web on, on some web web applications or yeah so our main goal is at the moment our main target is the the low level. Um, the, the low level side channels and the low level implementations or low level binaries. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we could also apply this to WebAssembly, for example. That I, I, think, I think we discussed at some point. That would be a higher end and uh, and uh, application stack. Okay, okay. Oh, all right, so it seems that we don't have uh, further questions of the audience. If no, so let's thank our speaker, Andres. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so right now, uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to share my screen. Oops, sorry. I'm going to share my screen and replace the audio of the audio. Um, so, in this work, we present a novel technique for the verification of quantitative hyperproperties. So what are hyperproperties? Hyperproperties are the properties that cannot be reasoned by observing a single trace of the system. Rather, they are defined over the sets of computation traces. A well-known example uh, of a hyperproperty is observational determinism. That ensures that a system should appear deterministic to an adversary irrespective of the secret inputs. Observational determinism is essentially a two safety property, which means that we need to observe at least two traces to determine if the system satisfies this property or not. But, so what are quantitative hyperproperties? Quantitative hyperproperties takes this idea one step further and allows us to express bounds on the number of traces appearing in a relation, enabling us to prove properties such as quantitative non-interference and quantitative deniability to name a few. They are particularly useful in capturing several important security primitives that are adversary observations. There exist exponentially many traces where the attacker's observations are the same, but the secrets are different. It intuitively means that just by the attacker's observations, its uncertainty for the secret is very high. Notice here that the number of traces appearing in the property is actually exponential in some system parameters, such as the length of the password, which makes the verification task a bit challenging. In fact, we would like to highlight three different challenges with the verification of such properties. First, as we discussed right now, is that the size of the property grows exponentially with it. So we need to reason about two to the n traces simultaneously, which is of course not scalable. Second, there is quantifier alternation. So even if we could somehow reason about two to the n traces, we have to show that for every trace there exists such two to the n traces satisfying the above condition. 
And finally, we cannot reason about symbolic bounds. This means uh, that it might be possible that we can prove such properties for some small values of n. However, what we would ideally like is to show that the property holds for all possible values of n. Of course, the task of verifying quantitative hyperproperties have been addressed previously as well. In 2017, Chen et al. introduced a technique that enables verification of certain classes of quantitative hyperproperties for programs. However, in this work, we are considering more general class of hyperproperty. Recently, in 2018, Finn et al. has made a significant progress in this direction. They came up with a technique that reduces the problem of QHP verification to the problem of maximum model counting, which in itself is a hard problem, although they were able to get, avoid self-composition. Their techniques, however, still produces formulas whose size grows exponentially with them, resulting the technique does not scale well. In this work, we address these challenges with our major contributions being the extension of quantitative hyper LTL which, is, which are defined over symbolic transition systems, making them more expressive. Also, we present a novel technique for QHP verification, which in general is a hard problem. But we show how to decompose it into non-quantitative hyper properties that are easier to discharge, and then counting the number of satisfiable solutions to a first order formula. The counting of the number of satisfiable solutions is again a hard problem. So we developed some inference rules to help us with that. And finally, we show some case studies where we are able to prove security properties for systems with parametric sizes. Let's begin by discussing our main case study, path ORAM. What are ORAMs? ORAMs try to address the problem of a client who wants to store and access data at a malicious server. To protect the privacy of the data, we can always encrypt it but it was shown recently that irrespective of the encryption, even our access pattern can leak information. ORAM in general helps us solving this problem by concealing the client access pattern from the server. The way path ORAM does this is by storing the encrypted data on the server in an augmented binary tree format, where each node of the tree stores some data block. Additionally, the client maintains a secret mapping called the position map to keep track of the path where the data block is stored on the server. What this means is that each entry in the position map maps a client address to a leaf node of the ORAM tree, while maintaining the invariant that every block is stored somewhere along the path from the root to the leaf node that it is mapped to by the position map. To access the data from the ORAM, the client first gets the leaf, which is mapped to the corresponding data block by the position map, then the client sends the request to the server for the path corresponding to that leaf node from the ORAM. Next, the client updates the position map entry for the Excel data block by mapping it to another random leaf node. And finally, it writes back the same path to the server, possibly after updating the data in case of a write operation. What this achieves is that if the client now again accesses the same data block, then, then as this was remapped previously to a different leaf node, the access request observed by the malicious server would be corresponding to this new leaf node. Hence, just by observing the access pattern, the adversary cannot determine what data block is being accessed by the client. Our model of path or RAM is a transition system where each step corresponds to a single execution of the access function uh, that we saw just now. The resulting trace of the system consists of client's request as input and the path accessed as adversary observable output for each state. Further, the position map is initialized randomly in the initial state and every subsequent update in the position map is done by sampling from a uniform random distribution. The security requirement of the path program is that the adversary learns nothing about the client's access pattern just by observing the server access. We formulate the security property uh, as the following deniability property, which states that for every trace of server accesses, there are at least n minus one factorial different traces of client accesses with identical server observation but different client requests. The challenging aspect of this quantitative hyper property is that we need to count traces for every trace pi naught. The question we want to ask here is 
Is it possible for us to define a relation between the traces of the system? The major insight is that if such a relation is possible, then instead of counting the traces of the system, we can reduce the problem to showing injectivity from a first order formula and then counting the number of satisfying assignments to that formula. We discuss this in more detail next. Our goal here is to break down the problem of verifying a QHP into a set of properties that are easier to verify. So to prove this property, the first thing we do is that we construct a relation U, which is parameterized by some auxiliary variable Y that relates the trace pi naught to another trace pi one, depending on the value of the variable Y. We call this relation U the trace enumeration relation. Next, we construct a first order logic predicate V of Y, which defines valid assignments to Y that can be used to enumerate these different traces via U. Finally, we want to prove two properties over U and V, which are essentially non-quantitative hyper properties, usually a two safety or a three safety property. The first one is that for every trace pi naught and every satisfiable assignment Y sub I to V of Y, there exists another trace that is related to pi naught via the trace enumeration relation U and the auxiliary variable Y sub I, such that the two traces have identical observations. Another property that we want to show is that U is injective in Y. That is, for any two different valid values of Y, we are able to enumerate two different traces from pi naught, let's say pi i and pi j, such that they have different requests. Recall that our initial goal was that we wanted to count the number of traces satisfying the QHP. The question is, how do we do that safely? So to find all the traces with the same observations, we can just rely on the first property. But if we count just using that, we might end up double counting. So for that reason, we introduce the second property, which is the injectivity constraint, so that we can count unique traces that are eliminated by this enumeration. What we have achieved by this is that we have devised a methodology by which given any trace of the system, we can generate several other traces of the same system using the satisfying assignments of V of Y. So the problem of counting traces is essentially reduced to the problem of counting the number of satisfying assignments to V of Y, which would lower bound the number of traces satisfying the original QHP. So to sum it up, we have reduced the problem of QHP verification to the quantitative hyper properties, essentially a two safety or a three safety property, and model counting a first order logic formula. Before proceeding further, let's now look at an example that shows how we can enumerate traces in the path of that. And what would the trace enumeration relation and the valid predicate look like? So consider the following snapshot of the path of execution. In this, the client wants to access the data block four, which is mapped to the leaf node one in the position map. The adversary observation includes the paths read by the client, in this case, the path corresponding to the leaf node one. What we would want is to construct another path program, which has the same adversary observable access, that is the path corresponding to leaf node one, however, a different client request. So the way we do this is we permute the position map and the data request in path over M1 by some permutation over 1 to N, where N is the number of data blocks. In this case, 4. This generates another position map and the corresponding path over M3. Since we permute the data request using the same permutation as well, we notice that we can choose a permutation such that we end up accessing the same list in path over M2 as in the case of path over M1. So in, for this example, the data block requested in path one is fourth, whereas the data block requested in path one two is the second. However, the ob uh, observable access pattern is the same. That is, the path is read corresponding to leaf node one. So in this case, what the trace enumeration relation does is, it takes a permutation y sub i and a trace pi naught and permutes the position map in the trace pi naught to generate a permuted version of the position map for the trace pi naught. So it ends up relating the position maps in the two traces by this permutation y sub i. We can extend the same idea to the entire trace, where the position map and data request are related by such a permutation. In this case, the first order logic predicate v of y 
is just an encoding for the definition of the permutation. We want to emphasize here that coming up with an appropriate U and V is where majority of human efforts comes in. This has to be given as input to the system. And furthermore, the proof obligations for showing that U and V are indeed enumerations also need to be supplied manually. So what we have seen so far is that to prove a quantitative hyperproperty, we reduce the problem of counting traces to counting the number of satisfying assignments in first order logic. The way we did that is, we first constructed a trace enumeration relation U and a valid predicate V, which is in first order logic. Then we proved the two properties discussed earlier to show that U and V are enumerations. And finally, we count the number of satisfying assignments to V of Y in Y, which will essentially bound the number of traces uh, satisfying the particular QHP. Observe that bounding the number of satisfying assignments is still a computationally expensive task. To do that, we exploit the structure in the formula and present some inference rules to help us with that. Observe that in order to show that the number of satisfying assignments in X for F of XY is lower bounded by the number of satisfying assignments of G of XY, it is sufficient if we can show F of XY implies G of XY. Similarly, to show that the number of satisfying assignments of uh, F of XY and X is equal to the number of satisfying assignments of G uh, of XY plus the number of satisfying assignments of H of XY, it is sufficient if we can show that F of XY implies G of XY or uh, H of XY. And G of XY and uh, H of XY is unsatisfiable. Clearly, proving the premises in such inference rules are much easier than counting the number of satisfying assignments, and we can easily discharge them by SMT solvers such as Z3. In fact, that's what we do. We evaluated our approach on five systems with varying complexity. We implemented our model in Euclid 5 framework and used Z3 to discharge proof obligation. The K-trace properties corresponding to proving enumerations were proven using self-composition and induction. The following table shows the size of each model for each of our case study, the number of lines of proof code, uh, which is the code for self-composition, property specification, etc the number of verification annotations, which include the invariants and pre and post conditions, and the verification time for each example. We observed that the verification for all the examples completes within a few seconds. The main challenge in the application of our methodology is, however, the construction of the trace enumeration relations, uh, associated valid functions, and the specification of the strengthening invariants. Finally, we showed that our technique is scalable and can be used in verifying properties of large systems. Although there are some manual efforts that are required. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I, we apologize again for the technical issues uh, during the, 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 the previous demonstration. I hope that this time it works better. So let's see. Um, so there's a couple of questions from the audience. Um, the first question is uh, from Kudeep. So what SMT, sor what SMT theory are you using in your current system? Hi, thanks for uh, taking care of the issue. Uh, we are using uh, linear integer arithmetic with uh, support for equality uh, as underlying theory. So we, we support uh, yeah, uh, bit vectors and arrays and linear integer. I see. So the second question is from Nora. And so, so basically, uh, could you briefly elaborate um, the, the, the manual effort that a security auditors need to like put on if you're using your system? Yeah, so the so first manual effort would be to construct these uh, trace enumeration relations from the valid predicate. And uh, essentially, you could construct, um, uh, I mean, you can construct more than one such trace enumeration predicate. And um, uh, as it happens with usually encoding the technique, uh, the, the choice of U and V uh, would dictate how your verification would work. Uh, so yeah, so that needs a manual effort as well as a certain domain knowledge to understand uh, yeah, what is the system we are verifying. Yeah, and uh, for, yeah, following by that, there are certain uh, proof obligations to prove that they are indeed trace enumerations. Uh, those need to be supplied manually. Okay, 
Um, so our next next question is from from Robotos. So basically, uh, for the example of this ORAM leakage, so because uh, the leakage is actually due to some of the bucket of the tree are full, it's already been like a fully occupied. So did you try to con t uh, consider that uh, try to put a bound on 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 the on the leakage? Yeah. So while modeling our system, we constructed the bucket of size uh, uh, four. Uh, we we did take um, you know, unbounded stash into consideration, uh, but uh, yeah, to model them we use bucket, but uh, the properties were uh, mainly focused around that for a given trace, uh, how many traces we can generate uh, corresponding to, uh, you know, how many traces you can enumerate, and we wanted to show an exponential bound on that. Yeah, but the model uh, has bucket and stash. I see, I see. So our last question is from John uh, Hoffman. So, so um, for the for the for the for the function y and u v of y. So does those function need to be constructed by hand? If yes, so how difficult is to like uh, come up with this kind of those functions? Uh, yes, uh, y and the v of y needs to be constructed by hand. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it will also depend on what enumeration relation u you, you are using because essentially what you want out of u is that given a trace you could enumerate another trace of the system, and uh, uh, your v would be uh, your y would be sort of uh, auxiliary variable which enables you to do that. Uh, uh, for us, uh, uh, while verifying path for m, that was the trickiest part to come up with the enumeration relation and uh, valid predicate. So the idea of uh, permuting the position map. Uh, uh, regarding whether it's always possible to find such a relation, uh, it's hard to say, but yeah, uh, we believe so. Yeah, we do believe so because uh, the the systems which we were verifying, we were able to find something. But yeah, it might need certain expertise, and it might be a bit difficult to find such a relation. Um, all right. So thanks, Shubhan, and thanks, um, thanks uh, everyone to attend the section. And we apologize again for the for the trouble of the technical issue. And that concludes our our section for five A. And um, I hope you enjoyed of the rest of the rec sections in CAP 2020. Uh, see you. Bye. Thanks, you. Bye. Bye.